What's up guys, David Land here. Welcome back to Indy 500 Evolution. Yeah, it's been a while since I've uploaded an Indy 500 Evolution video, but we are back and I am still committed to finishing this entire game on this channel in a full Let's Play. If you're new to this series, uh, Indy 500 Evolution is a game for the Xbox 360 which covers the IndyCar years of 1961 all the way through to 1971, an 11-year span of racing race cars and the most incredible development period in IndyCar racing. In 1961, of course, we started with the front-engine roadsters, and where we are in 1963, they are still the dominant racing machines, but the rear-engine Grand Prix-inspired uh, inspired, uh, racing cars are coming up through the ranks very fast. What you're looking at here is the uh, the point standings after three races in 1963. We have had a terrible 1963 season, working our way through a couple different chassis and engine combinations. We still haven't hit on anything that is very, very competitive. Eddie Sachs leads the championship by almost, uh, well, actually, uh, no, almost a full uh, two times. He's almost scored two times as many points as Dick Rathman. And then A.J. Foyt, Bobby Grimm, those guys are still fairly into the uh, into the championship, but uh, we're down there. We've only scored four points. I believe we did that at the Indianapolis 500, if I'm not mistaken. It's possible we did that somewhere else. I can't remember. Uh, I know there's somebody who's actually doing a history lesson of uh, every race, or a history review of every race that I've done in this game. Uh, so I appreciate that guy because he helps uh, keep me in check. So we're heading to Langhorn for the fourth out of six events in the 1963 season. We're going to do two races in this uh, video. We're going to do Langhorn and then, the, and then the next race, which I believe is the Milwaukee 200. So those of you who love Indy 500 Evolution, you're getting a double shot of it today. Let's head to Langhorn. So here we are looking at the folks who are qualifying at the moment. Bob Lloyd Green's Ruby is on the pole position at the moment. Bob Christie is about to go out. A great speed uh, from car number So it looking like the pole speed probably going to be around 120 miles an hour at the moment. Don Branson, lap. we've had a historic rivalry with him. Lots and lots of crashing between the two of us. Is next By the way, this game also has a uh, NASCAR Heat 2 system of where a the drivers you crash with 10. or run into will hate you and try to wreck you. So, um, yeah, if you guys like the NASCAR Heat 2 things with drivers trying to crash me, Car you're going to love this series. Bud Tinglestat goes run. fifth. Troy Rutman, Paul Arnelli Jones, Roger Ward. we got a lot of heavy hitters in this next couple uh, drivers. Of course, A.J. Foyt, Eddie Sachs, they're behind us. Speed from Arnelli goes to third with a 118. And then Roger Ward, he's probably going to go second. Lap. Another 118. Johnny Rutherford is going to Car go up to 117. Has qualified for the race. So now it is time for us to make our qualifying attempt. But first, we need to show you, or at least I need to show you, reveal to the world a little bit of experimentation and a great deal I have managed to make. We're going to see if it actually works out, though. A very special car is in my garage. So for those of you history buffs out there, you may have noticed the drivers Jim Clark and Dan Gurney were not in the field. Those guys are Team Lotus. And Team Lotus only showed up for two races in the 1963 season, uh, Indianapolis and Milwaukee. So that leaves some Lotus chassis without a racetrack to go to. Well, in the canon of the universe, or at least the story I'm making up, I was able to convince Colin Chapman to sell me a Lotus chassis. The caveat, of course, would be that I would have to go find my own engine, as Ford would not lease me one of their 4-cam engines to put in the back of my Lotus, as it's a privately entered car, or would be a privately entered car. Of course, uh, the Lotus uh, is going to be obsolete in the next year because, of course, Colin Chapman is already developing the 1964 Lotus. So what's a man to do with a chassis and no engine? Well, as you can see, uh, we've got uh, we've gone and went to an engine builder, one of the specialty Offenhauser engine builders, and we said, hey, look, we've got this chassis. We know it's got a lot of potential. Can you design us an engine or at least get something in the back of our car uh, to actually run because the Novi engines and the Offenhausers that we had had before uh, no longer were compatible with a rear engine car. So the uh, the Offenhauser builder said, I'll throw you something together for Langhorn. 
And that's why we've got a 1964 Offenhauser engine in the back, because of course we could not get a Ford. We've also got a five-speed gearbox, which uh, Chapman was nice enough to include with the car. Uh, I had to pay him quite a bit of money for it, though. So we are going to see if the Lotus is the real deal. All right, here we go in the Lotus. Well, Lotus chassis, anyway. And I've forgotten the, the, the uh, controls already. I almost completely blew up my new Offenhauser engine by shifting down instead of shifting up. But okay, here we go. Of course, Langhorn is a pretty much a perfect circle racetrack. And you may say, oh, that's not realistic. And then you realize, yes, this track actually existed. It was dirt first, then they ended up paving it in the mid-60s to modernize it. It was in Langhorn, Pennsylvania. And I've had some people in the comments tell me that a target now sits on the site of the racetrack. That's a shame. But a one mile oval here, and it's just such a weird, weird track. Uh, actually, there's a fact in the game that says uh, this track was nicknamed Puke Alley because of the fact that uh, you never really uh, stop feeling the G's. And there you go, 121.9, that is easily a couple miles an hour faster than the current pole speed. We've just got to maintain this over the next couple laps to be able to take a pole position, the first Lotus pole position. This may have been the perfect track to take the Lotus to, to be honest with you, because of the fact that it's all about handling when you're on an oval, but we're getting a little bit of understeer heading onto the main, or I guess the start-finish portion of the track. Wow, 122.95, almost 123 miles an hour. That is a fantastic speed. That's four mile, almost five miles an hour faster than the pole speed at the moment. And we've got to maintain it here. We've got one lap to go. Well, really less than half a lap here. Now, as we come around the final corner, you gotta be so, or the final corner, it's all one corner. You gotta be so careful that inside wall, we're gonna understeer out. 123.6, that's a fantastic qualifying effort. Wow, we absolutely blitzed the field and put our Lotus Offenhauser on the front row easily. Eddie Sachs was the next driver in line. He was able, also up in the 120 mile per hour uh, bracket, of course the points leader in one of those roadsters. Let's take a look at the grid as uh, we've got Sachs, Ruby, Ward, Chuck Hulse, Carnelli Jones, who was the 1961 and I believe, uh, or no, the 62 champion. I was the 61 champion. Uh, Foyt, Branson, Rathman, Rutherford, McCluskey, Boyd, Rutman, Tinglestead, McElreath, Wilson, Christie, and Otto. Otto is way, way off the pace. 18 cars, a circle. Let's go circle track racing. Welcome to the unique Langhorn Speedway. This near circular one mile oval is actually constructed on the side of a hill. And while it may look like a walk in the park, the high speeds attained here make this a dangerous circuit. All right, so we're ready to go here at Langhorn. Not a walk in the park as Bob Jenkins said, the pace car is off. We're bringing them down. The green flag is out and the race has begun. And we are underway and pulling away fairly swiftly from Eddie Sachs at the moment. Lloyd Ruby works his way up into second place, and the pack is forming up behind. Now we just got to be careful here. Now I, the last time we came to Langhorn, I was it was a great battle between myself and Parnelli Jones for the win. Jones actually caught and passed me in lap traffic, and that may end up being what happens here again. But again, if we can put a nice good lead on that rest of the field. I think we'll be all right. Hulse has moved up in his third place behind Ruby and the national championship leader is falling back, Eddie Sachs. And they are just packed up all together. Three wide off the corner it looks like. As we work our way completing lap number two just that quickly. It is a mile oval but it is a fast mile oval as we you saw 121 miles an hour, quite a bit slower than our qualifying pace, but hey, we don't need to worry about that at the moment. As they are just absolutely all packed together. Looks like Parnelli Jones is moving up to the field. His blue, number 98, Old Calhoun, is working his way down to the bottom of the track. 
So it may be Parnelli who we have to really battle with as Roger Ward moves up into second. That's a bit concerning because those are some heavy hitters as we do a 122, I believe. Just saw that go across the screen. It always seems like the uh, AI have better race pace than they qualify. Kind of the opposite of racing games these days where the AI are OP in qualifying and then have nothing for you in the race. It's completely different in this game. Crossing the line, completing lap number five. 121 so yeah our fast slap at a 122.4 and again we're just pulling a little bit of a gap on Parnelli Jones trying to race in circles here yeah I'm wondering if the guys who qualified up front are necessarily good race cars because it seems like a lot of those guys who are up at the front rows have started to fall back quite a bit as we cross the line there again We've got four seconds ahead of Parnelli, which is a good thing. The car is handling quite well at the moment, though I will say, playing on a controller, uh, you do start to cramp a little bit. You've just gotta, you've gotta use your precise movements and just move the stick ever so slightly. The controls are very touchy in this game, as you can see. If you move the uh, controller a little too much, as we set our fastest lap of the race, uh, the tires will skid all over the place. And we've just completely left the rest of the field. I'm feeling good about this at the moment. It's kind of a cruise right now. I guess Bob, what Bob Jenkins said about uh, being a walk in the park, maybe it will be a walk in the park. Who knows? So lap traffic is going to be the big key in this one going to be effectively getting around them without doing any damage to my rear engine Lotus. I'm the only rear engine car in the field. There have been rear engine cars, like I said, in the last couple races from Team Lotus mostly, but at Indianapolis there were a couple other teams that entered rear engine cars, namely the Sears Allstate team uh, that entered uh, the Thompson chassis. And then, of course, the Cooper Climax a uh, couple years ago in 1961. It's kind of the first rear engine car to really make a splash. So we've got five seconds on Parnelli Jones. That's definitely a nice uh, change of pace from where we have been, for sure. At least the, in terms of the last race we had at Langhorn. Where we raced with uh, Parnelli and ended up losing to Parnelli. It seems like we're pulling out about a half a second a lap. Which is pretty cool. Now, I am worried about lap traffic. I'm thinking we're going to be seeing them fairly soon as we're coming up on the midway point in the race. Next couple of laps I'd imagine we're going to see them. It is only a one mile oval, and even though there are only 18 cars in this race, that certainly doesn't mean that it's going to be, uh, that we're gonna be free from lap traffic. Again, the high speeds, like you, like Bob uh, Jenkins said, at this track mean that the faster guys are gonna catch the slower guys, and chaos may ensue. We're just consistently running in the 120 range, 120 miles an hour, which is quite nice. It's a nice, comfortable pace for this Lotus. Just able to hold it right now next to the bottom of the track. Without a lot of issues. Little bit of a slide going on there. There is tire wear and fuel consumption in this game. You, you uh, have it happen a lot in the Indianapolis 500 or it affects you in the Indi Indianapolis 500 because that race is so long. These shorter races uh, generally doesn't affect you too much unless you've got a really ill handling car like the Curtis Novi I was using to start out uh, this season with. As we are, I guess, we're at the midway point of the race 
when I crossed uh, the midway point of the track that time. And now I'm starting to see a lap car, just as I predicted. We're going to come up to 10 laps to go here the next time around. And that's going to start throwing a monkey wrench into this whole operation. As we've got almost 7 seconds on Pernelli Jones, so clearly... Clearly, the Lotus is a very, very well-handling car, as you'd expect. Nice and light. Good power output. I went with the five-speed transmission because I felt like it'd give me a little bit more drivability. And it seems like the Offenhauser engine doing a good job of maintaining everything. Giving me good power. I may have created a monster, now I think about it. And in fact, in the, the history of this universe, a rear engine car has not won a race yet. Now in real life, Jim Clark ended up winning at Milwaukee in his Lotus. But in this game, Clark, I believe, was involved in a crash. And Dan Gurney was the one who ended up carrying the flag for Lotus at that race. And now with a privately entered Lotus, we are absolutely putting a spanking on the field as we cross the line, lap number 17. We're coming up behind Thomas Otto. We've just got to be careful. we we'll work around the outside of him. No problem. Thank you for being a kind and considerate lap car, Otto. Appreciate that. And now we're coming up behind Bob Christie. Who's not having a very good race. Otto is the only driver who's not a real-life driver in this race, I believe. Uh, everybody else, I mean, there's an insane amount of officially licensed drivers in this game. I don't know how they did it. I don't know how they did it. It's, uh, this game's a masterpiece that nobody knows about. If you're an Indy 500 fan, an Indy car fan, and you have an Xbox 360, go and get it. It's a great history lesson. And it's pretty fun, too. As we've got, coming up to six laps to go. Still working our way. <laughs> I was going to say around the corner, but we've been in the corner for 19 laps. It's crazy. It never straightens out, this track. Would have been incredible to see this uh, as a dirt track as well. No dirt track racing in this game. Which is interesting because dirt tracks were such a big part of the uh, racing and the championship back in those days. Okay, so Christie's on the outside there. Very kind to me. Appreciate that. Raced me very fair. It seems like his car not handling very well. We're coming up to five laps remaining in the race. And we're coming up behind yet another lapped car. Johnny Boyd. Well, I think was fairly far up the field, wasn't he? He must have had a bit of an issue at some point, which took him out of the running. So we're going to work our way around, coming back up on the home stretch. Should have four laps to go this time around, if my calculations are correct. Yes, we do. I believe me, I know how these people are feeling at the back. I've been the guy at the back of these races for quite a while. And I may be convincing each and every one of them that I pass that maybe going to a rear engine chassis wouldn't be the worst idea in the world. So we've got three to go. Working our way back to the back side of the track. It's hard to say. I don't I want to say turn one, turn two, turn three, but I can never say that at this track because it's just like it's all a singular corner. And then back around to the main straightaway just that quick. It is a fast track. 
two laps to go. We're setting 122 mile per hour laps very fast. That's what we need to be doing. Of course, our 123 qualifying, I don't think we're going to approach, but I don't need to approach it. Clearly, I don't need the pace at the moment. We're coming up here behind Johnny Boyd. Gotta be so. This is the worst place to overtake on this track, is this the main stretch, because you Get just never know what's flat. gonna happen as Boyd goes down to the inside. Now he's gonna fight back on the outside. But uh, nothing doing from Johnny Boyd, nothing he could really do about that. And we'll quickly pull away from him and actually really start gaining on this car ahead of us. I don't know if we'll get him by the line. No, it's Troy Rutman, and we will not get him. We won't lap Troy Rutman, but a dominating, dominating Number victory takes the checkered flag. for the Lotus in my first victory in 1963. So the race results, as you can see, uh, Parnelli Jones respects me. Don Brantz, I guess, now likes me. He hated me at one point. Uh, but down through the rest of the field as we've got... Uh, uh, the race completed. The Boyd, Christie, Otto all finished one lap down. Rutman will be the last car across the line eventually. Car number 65 makes a yeah, there stop. he is. So there you go. There's the race results. Car number 98 Let's head back and take a look at how the points have car now stacked up. Makes a pit stop. So the point standings after four races. Sachs still maintains the points lead. Dick Rathman closed in a little bit on him. Parnelli Jones moves up in there in a three-way tie for third with Foyt and Branson. We've moved up to sixth in the standings by gaining 10 points with our win, uh, passing Grimm, Unser, Ward, Gurney. Rutherford got some uh, points as well. In fact, uh, all the way, we've got 17 drivers score points, so a fairly competitive season, all things considered, as you can take a look at the rest of the uh, field, uh, or at least the, the rest of the national championship registered drivers. The next race is the Trenton 300. And if you've watched this series, you know that Trenton is one of my worst tracks. So, in our double feature, let's take the Lotus to Trenton and try to break the Trenton curse. A great so, from car number nine. Eddie Sachs goes to the top of the charts at the moment. Parnelli Jones now takes the pole position with a 136 mile per hour car lap. Next to make a I run. wonder if 140 will be a potential lap a speed. Lap. There's a huge spread between the field, though. 10 miles an hour between Christie a great and uh, car Parnelli Jones. Bobby He's Grimm goes to the pole position a with a, uh, a 136. Lap. His purple car giving him the purple powered or the purple car power. Tinglestat goes to fourth with one with a 130 mile per hour average. A great speed from 134 for Johnny Rutherford. Very nice speed from him. The rookie a driver. Uh Troy Rutman, 129. So again, a big spread between the a fast guys and the slow guys. Alan 35. Crow, 125. Boy, oh boy. Ten miles an hour. Car the difference. Is next and to make McCluskey a goes to fifth. The 133, Dick Rathman, number 22 third with a 136. A and Jim Clark is here. Jim Clark and Dan Gurney have shown up. I didn't even pay any attention 52. to that. Well, there's three Lotuses in this race. A great speed from car Clark number goes to sixth with a 134. His Lotus Ford is sixth. My Lotus Offenhauser, let's find out. I suppose I only have myself to blame for the fact that the Lotus has showed up. Uh... Fairly unannounced. Uh, I guess I shouldn't have trusted the comment section. But, uh, yeah. Me taking a victory in a non-factory Lotus without a Ford engine. I suspect that ruffled some feathers. Uh, so, yeah. Lo Team Lotus is here. That That's going to be a bit of a pickle. Even though Clark didn't qualify all that well. We're going to have to see what we can do in our Offenhauser powder powered Lotus as we work our way down the front straightaway here at Trenton. We're going to work our way off into turn one. The uh, car handles quite well. We're going to get into fourth gear there. I feel like I could have taken a little bit more out of the car there in turn one. We'll have to see as we work our way through the right-handed corner on the back straightaway. And now into the very high banked turn number three. 
This uh, corner is uh, modeled, or uh, the turn one at Pocono is modeled after this corner. Fun fact. As we go down the main straightaway, what is our time going to be? What is our speed going to be? His hand is up. 133. That's almost pole position time. We've got to find a little bit more, but I think we're, we're close. We can maybe take the pole here at Trenton if we really get on it. I don't think the Lotus is particularly suited to this track. It's a little bit down on horsepower, I would say. So as we slide the car going off into turn number three, gonna work our way around right down next to the white line. Trying to scrub too much speed off the corner. Down the main straightaway, what's the time going to be? What's the speed going to be? Oh, it's gonna be close. 34.3. Pick up the speed a little bit. Car sliding just a little bit more. Now we work our way trying to take as much out of the car as we can here. Don't want to take too much. Slid the car in the kink on the back straightaway. That's not what we want to be doing. At least there's good power delivery. That's a positive. Ah, sliding the car in the exit just a little bit. Felt a bit slow coming off of turn number three. This may not be faster. We'll see, we'll see, we'll see. 39. Oh, just slower, just slower. Wow. We are 13th. The Trenton curse continues. Uh, we're actually behind the factory Lotuses. And uh, Grimm's got the pole position at a 136. So we're three miles an hour f slower than the Roadsters. Holy cow. So Grimm takes that pole position 13th out of 22 cars, so right mid-pack. Right mid-pack, along with all the Lotuses, because Gurney's 9th, Clark is 11th, and we're 13th. Well, boy, this is going to be crazy. The Trenton Curse may be continuing, but it's going to be a wild race. 300 miles at Trenton. Here we go. Welcome to Trenton International Speedway. This 1.5-mile oval track is very fast and a popular stop for all the drivers and teams. Man, it's a who's who of drivers ahead of us. Johnny Rutherford and Jim Clark behind us. Roger McCluskey, Bob Tinglestad. Here we go, 50 laps at Trenton. So we get past Rutherford there. So we work our way off into turn one. Try not to slide the car too much. Rutherford does not like us. As you can see, the negative sign above his head indicates that he is upset. Don't you wish that was in real life when uh, somebody doesn't like you and you just have the uh, have a sign over there? Oh, his Rutherford maybe take, took a little bit of a swipe at me there. We're going underneath the factory Lotus Ford of Clark. He couldn't quite get there. Clark will move back up into 11th position. He has not gained or lost anything off of the initial start. As Rutherford is all over the back of me, we're getting the draft going down the main straightaway. Of course, the Lotus a little bit slower on the straightaways but hopefully a little bit faster in the corners. As they go three wide into turn one, and it's Dan Gurney getting up into the wall. So the Lotus Fords run, or the Lotus Fords are running one, two. Well, not one, two, but ahead of me in the Lotus Offenhauser. We're gonna work to the inside of Gurney, try to anyway, not gonna happen. Again, like Clark, he kind of cut me off going into turn three. Oh! That was so close with Johnny Rutherford. He had a run. He took a swipe at me. Thankfully, nothing came of it. We got to get away from Rutherford. We have got to get away from Rutherford, that is for sure. So I'm going to try to get a run off of turn one here. Try to get in behind Gurney here. Not going to happen yet. But I may not have the best run off of turn one, but I think we can probably get a run here through, through turn three. So we got one of the Roadsters way out of the groove there in turn three. Going to run a bit low there. Probably not the smartest idea in the entire world. But Rutherford, he's not able to really close in too much. Jim Clark working his way behind that Roadster ahead of him. We get the car slowed up down into turn one. On the throttle we go. There we go. That was a good run. 
That was a good run. We've got to arc it through the kink on the back straight away. Now off into turn three we go. Oh, lots of understeer, lots of understeer through there. My car doesn't seem to be quite as well balanced as those Lotus Fords. And Rutherford really trying to get after me now. Really trying to get after me. And we're sliding the car just a little bit. I hear Johnny Rutherford all over the back of me. I heard him, but he didn't quite get there. Didn't quite get there. So we slice through the kink once again. It's a nice pack. It's a really packed up field. Which is certainly exciting racing because Jim Clark almost gets squeezed by one of the roadsters there. Clark is going to actually move up another position. Maybe. Dan Gurney's going to make it three wide down the main straightaway. That is, that is ill-advised. Ill-advised, Dan. Ill-advised. Maybe a Lotus pile up down here in turn one, don't know. So I got way too deep into turn one. That's gonna allow Rutherford almost to the inside of me. Thankfully, I out accelerated him off the corner. And we're able to maintain at the moment. Keeping the car, try to keep the car in the groove. Nope, there goes Rutherford. He finally got me. So we fall back to 13th. Lucky 13th. Looks like Gurney actually got around Jim Clark. Not sure when that happened. Must have happened when Rutherford was taking me. So we're going to run a very low and unconventional line there. Try to get the run on Johnny Rutherford. In fact, Johnny Rutherford may push us back up into this group here. Oh, and Jim Clark in the wall. Oh, Johnny Rutherford will hit him. Car number Somehow managed to avoid that issue, but then got hit by Bud Tinglestad. How bad is the car damaged? Not sure. There is a warning light on, but I'm not sure if anything is really that badly damaged. We're going to see what our lap times are like. Nothing as of yet. Seems like I just got sucker punched in the side. We'll see what the lap speeds start to look like. If I've fallen off too much, I may need to pit. Man, I thought I had that avoided. I thought I had that avoided, but Jimmy Clark in the wall. Still tires and parts down in the groove there. Seems like maybe the car's a little bit slow off the corner. We'll have to see. Let's see what the lap speeds are as we cross the line here. I didn't see him. I was too busy trying not to get run over. We get around Eddie Johnson there. You heard uh, Jim Clark has just come out of the pits after his repairs were done. After absolutely clouding the wall there. Maybe a downshift was not the most smart thing in the entire world through there. Okay. So we got McCluskey all over the back of us. We're running in 14th now. Somehow managed to lose two positions despite having two cars crash in front of us. Not sure how that works. Oh, McCluskey almost ran me over from behind there. We are catching up to Troy Rutman here, so that's a good thing. And it seems like that crash has spread the field out just a little bit. So not sure if that's a good thing or a bad thing. I would have preferred everybody to stay packed up because packed up cars are slowed up cars. Seems like there is a pack up there forming, so if we can get back on it here, we may be able to catch them back up. I always wonder about turn one. I feel like I never get through here particularly well. I always try different lines. Nothing doing yet. Nothing doing yet. And sneak in. Wow, we're really catching Rutman now. On the throttle we go. Now, slid a little too much into the corner. 
We're going to lose out on the exit. And away Rutman drives down the straightaway. Thankfully, we've got a nice gap there to McCluskey, so not to worry too much about him at the moment. Trying to pick up the throttle fairly late. Roll the car into the corner. Seems like that was a good way to do it as we're catching up to Troy Rutman here. Really get through turn two quite nicely, but we're going to lose out probably in turn three here. Maybe. We didn't lose too much. We're actually staying in the draft of Rutman at the moment. Come on, car. Come on, Lotus. Jim Clark, of course, removed from this race. He's no longer a factor. So by default, we've become the second best Lotus in the race. Gurney's still able to do much better than us. He's into turn two we go. Just try to get Rutman here. Well, that may have been good. Let's see. Oh, yeah. There we go. A nice up oh, little bit of... I don't want to say arrow push, but he definitely... I definitely got some understeer coming off the corner when he got in front of me there. McCluskey down to the inside. Ah, wow. McCluskey really threw it in there, and that screwed me up. Dang it. That's annoying. Okay, well, we lost a position there. But we were really catching McCluskey. I think we're definitely for sure... 100% faster than McCluskey. If I could just, you know, get through turn three properly, I'd actually be able to pass some people. But at the moment, that's not happening. That is not happening right now. In the fourth gear there. Trying to arc the car down into the corner. Not happening yet. Through turn two. Down into three. I feel like I may have gotten through there better. It's all about just not sliding the car. And even like just sliding a little bit in turn three seems to lose you so much momentum that you can't really do anything. That was not a well-taken corner. Now Bobby Marshman's all over the back of me to make matters worse. I also wonder if I'll have to make a pit stop. I'm a little bit worried that I might have to. Of course, the halfway point in this race is 25 laps, and I'm looking at the fuel, and it's going to be close. <laughs> it's going to be close. We work our way down the main straightaway. Marshman not close enough to make any kind of a move yet. But we've got a car almost hitting the wall there. Troy Rutman almost catching the wall. So that might help us a little bit. So we just work our way around. Right under the white line. Maintain momentum, maintain momentum. And yeah, Marshman's still back there, but we got a good run off of turn three. It seems like we launched up here into this fight. And now Rutman seems to be slowing up just a little bit off of the corner. Let's see if we can get him here. Well, we've got to run, but can we maintain anything? Can we do anything with it? It's going to be a turn three. Oh, yes, baby. That is a pass. Now, is he going to get me back? Is Rutman going to get me back? He's going to go to the inside. There he goes around. But this time, this time. Oh, no. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. That was a big mistake. 
That is not going to endear me to Troy Rutman. That is not going to endear me to Troy Rutman, I can tell you that. That was a big time mistake. You never want to wreck a guy. I thought I was very much okay getting in behind him and pulling out. But as it turns out, I pulled out and uh, the front of my car hooked the back of his and around he went. A great pit stop for car number 17. That means we lose a little bit more ground to McCluskey, which is unfortunate. Try to work our way through turn one a little bit better. Oh no! Oh, I downshifted. Oh, we are out of the race. I blew the engine up. Well, that uh, that went from bad to worst. Oh, that was that was ugly. That was ugly. Twenty second, stone dead last, zero points. That's that's disappointing. That is so disappointing. First, I think this is the first time I've DNF'd a race. And we do it at the Trenton Speedway. The curse continues. We can't seem to break it. Bobby Grimm took the win over Dick Rathman, Lloyd Ruby, Eddie Sachs, and Parnelli Jones. Oh! Jim Clark finished 20th. Rutman, 21st. Of course, I wrecked him. He somehow re still respects me. I guess I apologized uh, to him. I don't know. Let's head back and take a look at the point standings after a depressing finish in Trenton. Oh, the 1963 season has been a complete shambles. A complete shambles. Sachs is, uh, has got a, well, not a big points lead anymore. Dick Rathman is closing in as we've got one race remaining, the 1963 Milwaukee 200. Milwaukee, one of my better tracks. Unfortunately, in this season uh, was the first time I had been defeated at Milwaukee. But with our Lotus, uh, I think I've got a really good chance. Assuming I don't downshift and ruin my race by blowing the engine, I think we'll be okay. Uh, we still only got 17 drivers who have scored points in the national championship. But I would expect Lotus is also going to be at Milwaukee as well. Team Lotus, I should say, not just my Lotus chassis. It's going to be another very tough race, a very stacked field, as it was in Trenton. Uh, hopefully this time I'll be able to finish it. So thank you guys so much for watching. Thank you guys so much for supporting the Indy 500 Evolution Let's Play uh, and sticking with it. If you did enjoy it, please hit the like button, and we'll see you in the next video, which will be the Milwaukee 200.